Hi everyone, my name is Abhishek Shah. Today I'll be presenting on quantifying data flow analysis with gradients and LLVM. This is joint work with Gabriel Ryan, Dong Dong She, Kastu Babat, and Suman Jana. So we'll begin, we'll begin with the toy program. Imagine we have a program that declares two variables and then sets z equal to the result of x plus x and then feeds z to a system call. What data flow analysis seeks to do is detect if there is a variable that affects another variable. So in this case, does variable x affect variable z? And why is this useful? You can imagine if x is set to some user input and you're in the security realm and you're trying to detect a vulnerability, you want to know if variable x affects variable z, that is, if there's a data flow between them two. And you can imagine in the security realm, you don't want malicious user input to affect uh, the arguments to a highly privileged system call. There's also a data flow between this technique of data flow analysis and other program analysis tasks. For example, in guided fuzzing, you can identify which bytes affect which branch variables and focus on these bytes. In information leak discovery, you can detect which uh, sort of inputs affect CPU usage or memory usage. Um, so that's how it's useful there. And then it's also being used in malware analysis. One popular instantiation of data flow analysis is dynamic taint analysis. The idea here is that we have certain variables that we want to mark as sources and sinks. And we want to detect if there's sort of this flow of data between the sources and sinks. So in this case, we have variable x. We're going to mark it as the source. And we're going to see uh, if this sort of, when we mark it with the source, this taint or color, if this taint will flow to the variable z. We can encode this taint or color using Boolean labels. And these Boolean labels represent the absence or presence of this color or taint. And so in this case, when we hit the instruction z equals x plus x, we want to know if this taint or color will propagate. And in this case, a natural sort of rule is if the input operand is tainted or has this color, then the output operand will too. It's a natural set union operation. And so for every operation, we have rules that will propagate this taint or this color. But one limitation of this rule is that some of these rules, one limitation of this approach is that some of these rules can be imprecise. So for example, we have the same exact snippet except the only thing that has changed is that we switch to a subtract instruction. The idea here is that we can use the same rule. So if x is tainted, then z would be tainted. And so that's what our rule would tell us. But it turns out that this is a false positive, And this should not be a valid data flow. The reason for this is x minus x is 0. And so there's no way that variable x can affect variable z because there is no data flow. And so the idea here is that some of these rules can be imprecise. And the subtraction rule in particular can introduce false positives. Another limitation of dynamic taint analysis is that these taint labels themselves are Boolean in nature, and they're discrete. And for that reason, you cannot quantify these data flows. You cannot detect how variable x affects variable z. And because we don't have this quantification in terms of figuring out which data flows are most important, we cannot assign an order to them. So that's another limitation of this approach. And so how do we get around this? We draw from the field of calculus. And the idea here is that the slope is a way of quantifying the rate of change of how an input affects a variable output. And so in this case, if we have the function y equals 2x, the slope is 2. And that indicates that if I change x by 1, y will change by 2. And in higher dimensions, the slope is also known as a gradient. And so that's what we basically did with this line of research. We use gradients to track uh, and quantify data flows in, in sort of data flow analysis. And so instead of marking the taint source with a Boolean taint label now, we'll mark x with a gradient of 1. And then when we hit the instruction z equals x minus x, we'll use the rules from calculus. So the gradient of z is equal to the gradient of x minus the gradient of x. And because the gradient of x was 1, we'll have 1 minus 1. And so the gradient of z is now 0. And that's exactly what we want to capture. Additionally, you can imagine in the case if it was x plus x, we could do 2x, and so when I change uh, x by 1, the, the gradient of z is 2, and that indicates that if I change x by 1, z will change by 2. And so why do we use gradients? They quantify the data flows, and also these rules compose precisely due to the chain rule of calculus. But this chain rule of calculus only applies when you have differentiable operations. And programs, unfortunately, do contain non-differentiable operations. 
For example, if we take the bitwise and operator, and the code snippet for it is to the right, we have a following graph. And there's some discontinuities here, um, x equals six, when x equals seven, it's also one, and then when you see x equals eight, it drops immediately to zero, and so there's this discontinuity. So what we need to do is be able to compute a gradient in this regime. One way to compute this gradient is to take the point to the left of it. If we're evaluating the gradient at x equals six, you can take the point to the left of it, or maybe the right, and try to use that as an approximation. Another approach is to sample uh, the region around x equals six. So in this case, sorry, in this case we look for seven, and then maybe eight, nine, 10, and ideally we wanna use the minimum. And if we have multiple minima, like in this case, we pick the closest one. And so this idea of sampling around this area of the point you're evaluating at is known and captured by the idea of proximal gradients. So proximal gradients will find local minima in this sort of bounded region to approximate the gradient. And so proximal gradients are a way of approximating the actual gradient. So I'll show you a quick example of how this works. The idea is that we're gonna sample this region and this red sort of line indicates the cost, or basically the, we're trying to find the local minima of this region and this red line will increase as we go further away just to show that if we have multiple minima, we pick the closest one. And so now, once we have this local minima, we'll use, we'll start at x equals six, we'll go to x equals eight in this case, and use that as the approximation of the gradient. And why did we choose proximal gradients? There are actually really nice theoretical guarantees of how you can bound the region. So in this case, you don't have to search everywhere, you can just search a certain region of it to, to make the gradient pretty approximately correct. Instead of calling our technique dynamic taint analysis, we call it proximal gradient analysis. We implement it in LLVM. It's based on LLVM's uh, data flow sanitizer, which is a state of the art dynamic taint analysis tool in LLVM. And the main idea of how we implement this is instrumented or is shown below. So for every application code snippet, we'll add additional instructions to propagate the gradients for the application instructions. So when we have y equals two times x, we'll have this corresponding normal program sort of uh, contents and then we'll add this instrumentation to be able to propagate these gradients. So the key idea one is that we'll instrument operations to propagate gradients, and now once we have these gradients, we have to shore, store them, uh, and we'll use this concept of shadow memory to store them. So a concrete example of how this instrumentation works, let's imagine we have the following snippet. We have the same regime as before, two variables declared, and z equals x plus x. We'll allocate x and z, using the LLVM IR, this is the generated LLVM IR. Then these uh, sort of variables will be loaded into registries, and then we'll add the two. So three corresponds to the loading of X, and five corresponds to the loading of X, and then we'll store these into Z. And now the instrumentation occurs. So for every allocated variable, we'll allocate a corresponding area in shadow memory. Whenever we load these variables into registers, we'll load their corresponding gradients into registries. And whenever we encounter an add instruction, we'll compute the corresponding gradient using the corresponding rule um, according to the chain rule of calculus. And to achieve this instrumentation, we instrument, uh, sorry, we instrument operations at compile time using the instruction visitor class. So for example, the visit binary operator would insert a call to this runtime library, and this runtime library will actually compute the gradient dynamically once it has access to these raw values. Sometimes these operations cannot be instrumented. Um, for example, memcopy, because you don't have access to the source code. And so what you can do is instead of calling memcopy directly, you can actually uh, call wrappers around it. And these wrappers are responsible for propagating uh, the data flows, or the gradients in this case. And so the instrumentation will not call the operator directly, it'll call the wrapped operator. So it's a similar idea for functions and their arguments and their return values. So at runtime, we have basically uh, code that will find, in this case, the proximal gradient for the bitwise AND operator uh, with these concrete values by doing a sampling. And we have sort of minimal runtime overhead because all the instrumentation is inserted at compile time as opposed to dynamic binary instrumentation. Um, this is the same pattern followed by address sanitizer and it has shown well uh, to have sort of minimal runtime overhead. Once we have computed these gradients, we need a way to store them. And so the idea here is that for every application level memory variable, we have a corresponding gradient in the shadow memory, 
Um, and so we could dire directly store these gradients in the shadow memory, but it turns out that most of these gradients are the same. A lot of operations are just move and, oh, sorry, load and store operations, so you just transfer the gradients. And instead of recopying the gradient for every single variable, we factor them out so that we can share them. And so the gradients are actually factored out into this gradient table. And so variables actually store an ID, and that ID is basically an index into the actual gradient. So this enables sharing gradients across many variables. And we basically uses indirection to solve this. So every variable has an associated shadow memory with this label, an ID. This ID indexes into this table, and so this enables multiple variables. You can imagine a variable here and a variable here. They all share the same index to that gradient. For our evaluation, we found that our tool performs better than uh, gradient or DFSAN, data flow sanitizer, uh, up to 33% better. And our evaluation was using this methodology that basically found the set of valid data flows in a program. To find these valid data flows, we use these parsing programs. And the idea here is to find these valid data flows is that we would mark all the input files to these uh, programs. We would edit the input bytes. And if there was a change in branch cover, that would be considered, for our case, uh, a good, uh, a valid data flow. And it's an approximation. So there's some issues there. But that's our approximation of ground truth. And then once we identified these valid data flows, we would uh, see if our tools would find these same data flows. And so our tool, DFSAN, uh, was able to have higher precision. Or sorry, our tool was GRSAN. It was able to have higher precision. And the idea behind this is that in certain cases, especially in these two cases, mini GSIP and DJPEG, um, when you have a bunch of operations and compression algorithms, the data flows will cancel out, and you'll have a lot of AND operations. And so while in practice you don't have Y, like Z equals X minus X, that's, I don't think we found that many cases, you'll have ANDs operations, especially in these compression algorithms, and the data flows, when you have ANDing of zero, will just cancel. And so Taint would believe that if it's an AND operation, you'll set union it, but in the gradient case, we don't. And so that's how we were able to have higher precision uh, in the sense that we were able to remove false positives. Uh, and precision just remembers uh, the number of valid data flows and then recalls this the number of total data flows you compute. What's more interesting, I think, is that we can use this tool to find bugs. Um, and so the idea here is that because we have a way of quantifying the data flow, we can order them. So if you know that certain data flows exist, you can pick the ones with the highest gradients and sort of try to edit them to trigger, um, in this case, memory allocation errors. If you can edit the input to some vulnerable operation as malloc, or if you can overflow the bitwise operator operation. Um, so that's what we basically did. We tracked the gradients for arguments to these known vulnerable operations, such as bitwise and memory allocation operations, and we were able to find uh, a decent amount of bugs in these programs. So the key takeaways, one, is that this framework in LLVM, Data Flow Sanitizer, uh, with minimal changes, you can actually compute very interesting dynamic analyses from it. Um, with minimal changes, we were able to propagate gradients instead of propagating Boolean taint labels. And then two, uh, this idea of non-smooth optimization and gradients, uh, there's probably some interesting connections to explore in future work uh, with that in program analysis. Um, I think a lot of like loop-related optimizations involve polyhedra. Um, I think there might be interesting things to explore there with uh, non-smooth optimization instead. So I think that concludes this talk, and if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. So um, maybe you mentioned this during your presentation and I missed it. What was the primary advantage of moving to a gradient table and allowing um, different um, statements to share gradients? There was two main issues. One was uh, memory usage, um, especially if you, like the actual data flow sanitizer uh, supports this idea of sparse labels. And so um, basically you want to minimize the number of labels you have so, it's so that in the shadow memory you minimize the number of shadow memory. Um, and the second reason is that imagine you have a different data structure or you have multiple data structures. If you can have these indices into like multiple data structures. So instead of having just a gradient track, you can track like the Boolean taint label, maybe an interval. Um, if you store these interval, gradient, and Boolean table all into shadow memory, your shadow memory would explode. So that when you decouple them, you can have multiple tables. And then you can have this sharing as well as like multiple uh, data structures tracked. So that's the main reason. 
Okay, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.